Hey guys, I'm Jacinda Robinson and welcome to the Fearless Podcast, where I interview athletes who have achieved incredible things. Today's guest is a well-known chef in Australia. In 2011 though, he was in a house fire that had changed his life forever. He was burnt over 40% of his body. In the podcast, we speak about how did he recover? How did he get to running 5K again, running up mountains, running long distance running? He's an inspiring man and talks about his journey. He also shares tips and tricks on when you're cooking in the kitchen and how you can eat healthy and live and enjoy your life every single day. I'd like to welcome Matt Galinsky. Matt, you've had an incredible career as a chef. You're on Ready, Steady, Cook, and you've been um, chefing, is that what it's called? Chefing? Yeah, you've been you can call cook- that. Yeah, cooking, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, around the world. What inspired you? Um, I was like, I'd like to be able to tell you that it was, you know, from sitting on my nonna's knee making gnocchi in the kitchen or whatever, but there was none of that. Yeah. Like, really, I grew up on, you know, a meat and three veg and, you know, boiled sausages and white sauce <laughs> and stuff like that, really overcooked, you know, Brussels sprouts and cauliflower. Mm. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what inspired you. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was what inspired me. Often it does happen like that with chefs. Um, but... You know, I grew up surrounded by good food. I grew up on a farm mm. on the Sunshine Coast and, and you know, I knew from, from a really early age, you know, I remember the, the moment that I went, okay, yeah, this is, I really enjoy this. This is what I mm. want to do with my life. And, you know, by the time I hit high school, I knew that that's what I wanted to be and mm. that, you know, I chose all my subjects at school and high school but, and I chose to do French and art and cooking and biology mm. and anything that had anything to do with cooking because I was so sure at 13 that that's what I wanted to do with my life. So I was really lucky in that respect that, mm. you know, there was no doubt in my mind whatsoever. I was telling a story the other day about how I, you know, for my 13th birthday, all I wanted was a cordless electric mixer. Oh, really? Yeah, 13 year old boy. My mum my and dad must have been thinking and asking a few questions, yeah. you know? <laughs> But, you know, that was... What are you wanting to make? Did I you wanted have to like... make marshmallows. Oh. And, the, like, the the really sad, ironic part of all that was I got this cordless electric mixer. It was a, it was like a, you know, a, a thing that you plugged onto this... You drill onto the wall and then yep. you plugged it in and then you could pull it off. And I don't know why, why I needed a cordless <laughs> one. Like, I don't know what, what where I thought I was going to be remotely making marshmallows. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I wanted it for, yeah. you know. So I was like, "Yeah, I need this mixer." And then the problem with a cordless mixer back in those days, the technology and it wasn't fantastic. So, you know, it, it actually would run out of batteries halfway through making marshmallows. <laughs> and so it was kind of sad. I was like, total waste of a birthday present. Really, yeah. you know, I should have just gone with a cord on it. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's in my head. That so from you know. Just an illustration from 13 years, mm. I was, you know, what I wanted kids mm. at 13, they wanted a motorbike or a gun or, a, you know, whatever. You wanted a mixer. <laughs> <laughs> mixer. Yeah, it's terrible. So, Matt, I'm a vegan. Tell me, if you were to cook a vegan dish, what would you cook? Oh, well, there's heaps of options. I actually, I was a, I was a vegetarian when I started my apprenticeship. And mm-hmm. so I worked at a little restaurant in West End called Squirrels, which mm-hmm. was like the, you know, um, the very first of, you know, way ahead of its time. It was yeah. doing gluten-free and macrobiotic and all this sort of stuff. And so I learned to do a lot of things with tofu and tempeh and mm-hmm. all those good protein sources mm-hmm. for vegans. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I do dishes now that are things like using things like coconut um, yogurt and tempeh and oyster mushrooms and mm. you know that all that combining Sounds all delicious. those textures and flavors yeah, yeah. It really there's some great stuff out there for vegans now like it's yeah. not like it's hard to be a vegan anymore i don't reckon there's so much yum stuff mm. but we have at the restaurant that i work at we oh, probably a couple of months ago this cute little japanese couple walked in and and said oh we make this tofu do you want to buy some and i was like yeah, I took it in and rolled it in rice flour and threw it in the deep fryer and fried it until it was all crispy and then just poured heaps of soy sauce on it. It was like, yeah, I'll have 200 pieces tomorrow, please. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they've become a huge um, supply to us now oh, because wow. it's just it's great just having handmade tofu, you know, yeah. straight from the from somebody making it fresh for us every couple of days. Yeah. Um, do they live yeah. in Australia? Yeah, yeah, they're just in Wow. Yep. Yeah. 
I okay. just rocked in and said, oh, we make this. Do you want to buy some? Like, yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so you were working at the restaurant and I read in an article that for you, you knew that you had to go learn how to cook meat. Why is that for you to be a more of a well-known chef? Well, it wasn't about being more well-known. I just wanted to know everything about food. Okay. You know, and the interesting, the amazing thing about the food world, that you know, is that it's you can you'll never know everything there is to know about it there's mm. just so much to learn yeah you know that there's and you think you've you think you know a lot and then all of a sudden you realize you know you, you'll discover new ingredients and new techniques and things and you realize oh, I don't know anything yet you know but mm. for me it was kind of like yet yeah, I'd reached a level of and it was so good to start my apprenticeship in a vegetarian restaurant and that and because then for the produce is the focus, mm. the fruit and vegetables and the seasonality and everything else is the focus. Mm. It's not about here's a chunk of meat and put some stuff with it. Mm. You know, it's about looking at the vegetables as the stars, mm. um, and then anything else you add to it is is extra. Because mm. um, that is like disappointing. Like when like my me personally going to a restaurant and like say they're not really vegan or vegetarian, and you go and you get a dish and it's just like. These veggies yeah, and you're like, here's Ooh. your risotto. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great, the risotto again. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And uh, I think the world's changing in that respect. It, it's becoming a larger share of the market, mm. the vegan and vegetarian side of things. Mm. And so chefs have to get creative with that and, you know, not just do boring stuff like, oh, here's your pasta with tomato sauce or whatever. It's got to be, you know. And there's so much you can do with that now. Mm. Um, but that would keep it so interesting for you if there's constantly always these new things to learn and like what you said with the flavours and what to put with what. Yep. And um, so what's the um, restaurant that you're working at in Noosa? Um, well, I work for a resort um, called Pepper's Resort up okay. there in Noosa, just off Hastings Street. Um, and my job there, I've got it pretty pretty cushy really to be honest <laughs> i'm called some you know wanky name like consultative executive chef or something which means <laughs> oh, i don't have to do much uh my job there is to be the creative person i write the menus oh, i cool. come up with the new dishes yeah. i look at what's available the whole idea of me going there them asking me to go there was that i'm the guy that knows all the farmers in the region and the local produce mm. and i'm able to kind of siphon it all into a menu mm. and go okay well this guy's got this for three months i can just you know the strawberries have come in now we've got the strawberries on the menu and then be ready for when they finish in october to have the mangoes ready to go on the menu to yeah. replace the strawberries and so i'm got my finger on the pulse of what's around and you know and the peppers really wanted to have a focus for their customers to, on giving them an experience of what is noosa what is the sunshine coast food mm. re as a region and you can come there and, and the food tells a story, you know, and yeah. that's, that's my job essentially is to, is to, you know, there's a head chef there who runs the place and orders mm. the stuff and fires and hires and does all that sort of thing. Um, but I just get to go there and go, you know, and, and it's something I love to do. And it also gives me the scope to keep doing all the other stuff I love. I travel mm. a lot. I've just been in Winton last week and before that I was in Gundawindi and before that I was in Emerald and I go to all these different little country towns and meet yep. heaps of cool people and, you know, and cook there. And, you know, everywhere I go, it's a different challenge for me. Oh, that's cool. Um, it is. It's really fun. And I love, yep. you know, I love getting around and doing all that stuff. And, and it also gives me an opportunity to see what makes those little towns tick what's mm. grown there you know go there mm. and I'll go to the chickpea farm and make it my mission to go and see as many farms as I can while I'm there yeah so I can get a picture in my head of okay this is emerald they grow wheat and they grow chickpeas and they mm. grow sorghum and they grow cotton and they have oranges and they have you know and so in my head I understand what emerald is mm. as a region um and do you think like, cause you know how like there's lots of, um, um, talk about pesticides and stuff like that. Do you feel like the local, um, regions like Emerald, like what you're saying, uh, like, are they heavy into trying to get rid of the pesticides or like, what have you found? So much more now, I reckon. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, in the olden days, it was just like a blanket, like, yeah, here's your seeds and here's the stuff that you just spray. They're all, like, <laughs> they're all over them. <laughs> and now a lot of the farmers are realising that that's just, you know, it's mm. stupid. It's not it's not sustainable for their properties. Like, 
when when a farmer owns a piece of land and it's been in their family for generations, mm. they want it to improve. <laughs> they don't want to just drive it into the ground until it's unusable anymore. Yeah. And they're starting to really think in that sustainable mm. way. It seems everywhere I go now, yeah, there's more and more farmers going, yeah, well, this is what we do to preserve water and this is what we do to so we don't have to crop dust the whole lot with a plane and spray mm. it with all sorts of stuff to stop it from getting pests or disease or whatever so there's that's awesome it really is, it's it, you know by no means do i think it's uh, you, we're out of the woods yet with that sort of thing like yeah. i'm sure there's still plenty of people out there that just go yep yeah, well we want the best possible crop and the highest possible yield so we'll spray whatever we have to spray on it you know i'm yeah. sure it still happens out there yeah but at more least there's more farmers tune. like yeah. it's changing and yeah that's right mm. and they want that to be there for their children and their children's children to, you know, and to be actually seeing, watching the land improve rather than degrade. So mm. I think there, I see that more and more all the time, which is heartening. Mm. That's awesome. Mm. So Matt, tell me about, um, in 2011, mm-hmm. your life, um, took a turn and you've had a complete change. Mm. Um, tell the listeners about what happened. Um, yeah. So in it was Christmas day, 2011, I'd just, made a whole extended family Christmas lunch and you know we all sat around and um having a lovely time and everything everyone went home and that night we went to to bed and my three girls and my wife and I and um you know I woke up eight weeks later from being in a coma Mm. uh, and all my girls were gone and my house was burnt down and I had nothing left you know I had no family no no house no possessions or everything I'd ever owned in my life was gone yeah my, my girls you know who I absolutely adored um, the girls were had twin girls that were thirteen and a, and another daughter that was eleven. Yeah. Um, I got forty percent third degree burns to my body. Yeah. So basically, top half was burnt. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you remember why you got burnt? <coughs> Do you remember like how you got out? Or uh, no, not really. To be no. honest, you know, yeah. It's all in that those sorts of situations, and maybe you block it out, but it was a complete blur. Yeah. You know the the that um you know that situation but it was mm. uh you know so woke up they kept me in induced coma in in icu in Bris- royal brisbane for eight weeks yeah and um then slowly woke me up out of that and to, you know waking up after two months of and going oh okay this is my life now yeah um and then i spent another two months in hospital after that in you know doing getting more and more grafts and so they basically take off well, you, you know, when you, if you've got 40% burns on the top, they use all the bottom part of you as the skin grafts as well. So they rip all your skin off your legs and plaster it all over you. And then seven days later, they come back and they do it all again. Does the they skin, does the skin re Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. And they take another layer yeah. and they whack it on there and it doesn't take. So they have to get infected and they have to do it again. So it's like this lengthy, lengthy process that, yeah. you know, and, um, but yeah, I had... Yeah. So how so, is rehab? Because like you've been in hospital for that amount of time. Like, mm. what happens to your body? Well, like, basically, I'd lost. I woke up. I was probably eighty odd kilos um, before I got burnt. I was sixty when I woke up, so mm-hmm. I had no muscle tone. I couldn't walk. Mm-hmm. I had a trachea in, so I couldn't speak. Yeah. Um, I was being fed through a tube, and tubes coming out of me everywhere. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you would have been in like shock. Oh, right? absolutely, like, and I'm sure that. You know those sort of situations. They control your um, your mental mood with lots and lots of drugs. You know yeah. they know that you you know you're you're me. They go okay, we'll have to like bring him out of this very very slowly so he has time to try and get his head around what's happened to him. Yeah. So they'd keep you up to the eyeballs in all sorts of you know men- brain drugs. I'd I'd imagine. I don't know yeah. what they gave me, but. You know, they, they they slowly wean you off that stuff, but it's really controlling your your mental health with drugs so that you've got time to compute what's going on with you and, and you can bring yourself out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was a situation of waking up and just going, oh, my God, why on earth did they keep me alive? You know, like they, I died so many times in ICU, you know, mm. and because the thing is with burns is that it, it doesn't, it's not just, doesn't just affect your skin. Mm. your body's in such shock that your liver 
fall, you know, breaks down and your kidneys break down and your heart breaks down and your, uh, all your organs start so to fail. shutting down, yeah. So they have to keep on fixing all those bits of you as well as your skin during that time. So, yeah. you know, I'm very lucky that you know, there's plenty of times that I could have gone in those mm. eight weeks, but obviously I wasn't meant to. Um, Did they have to replace anything or they just kept? No, they just, you know, wow. keep you alive, keep reviving you and, you know, checking on stuff. But it's, yeah, yeah. so it's a, it's a credit to those health professionals that they're able to actually do that. It's pretty mm. amazing. You know, I was in awe of the entire hospital system that I experienced while I was there mm. and just the care and the love that those people give, you know, and I go back and see them as well now every Christmas mm. and go back to the, to the burns ward and hand out hampers to all the burns people in there because it's kind of, it's, I think it's, and they appreciate it. Staff appreciate it. The patients appreciate it. I think because it gives them an opportunity to see, what someone looks like yeah. seven years on, you know, yeah. eight years on. And you on. can walk and you, you can, can go, talk. Yeah, that's you... right. And I've been, you know, I've mm. found the strength somewhere to, to carry on and, and do that. So I think mm. it's, you know. I quite, uh, so did you have to like learn how to move your arms again? And Yeah, well, it, there's the physio starts from day one. So while I was still unconscious, there's <laughs> yeah. like physios in there stretching you and, oh my you God. know, because – your skin re- retracts as well. So you get yeah. real, you know, you know, if they didn't do that, then you lose movement by not yeah. being up by your skin tightening up. Mm. And probably um, calcification around the bones and that's stuff. That's what I had. Yeah. Very oh, you, much so. Yeah. So that, yeah. there's a thing called heterotopic ossification, which basically essentially translates as too much bone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's just like, um, it's, and it happens mostly in males, mm-hmm. mostly around 40 years when they get burnt. Mm. So it's your brain saying to your body, hey, he's in trauma. You need to send heaps of calcium to the joints, which is not helpful at all. Oh, it's yeah. It's really okay. stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're not really sure what happens. It happens in some burns patients and not in others. Oh. So, but I had it and it can happen in your knees or your ankles or whatever. I had it mm. in my elbows. Mm. So for two years, my elbows were that for, at 90 degrees. Oh, look. So, yeah, they, right. lock, they lock there. So in physio, they yeah. spend heaps of time just going, uh, pushing, uh, pulling. And and is that painful really for you? Painful. Uh. Oh, you'd see the physio come to the door and you'd be trying to clamber out of the bed get it, to get away from them because oh, it was no. like that. Yeah. Um, but I did it anyway. And and because if I hadn't of, it might have, my arms might have been like that. And yeah. Was, you know, couldn't do anything basically. You know, I, so I, I did what I was told, did the physio, but eventually the best that they could do was, you know, they were locked at 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. And the thing is they can't go in and do anything about it until your brain stops sending that signal. If they go in there and they take it out early, it just grows back. So your brain was still sending the signal to, oh my God. So what happens is that every few months they, they take you in, they inject you with a dye, they, if it lights up on mm-hmm. your elbows or wherever you've got the, the HO, yeah. then they know that it's not time yet. So once it stops, then they can go in. So they basically, the, the surgeon goes in, cuts your elbow open, yeah. gets a big chisel and just hacks all that bone out. Oh my and then, God. So now my arms are that. So they're about oh, 20 that... degrees, 15, 20 degrees off being straight. Yeah. And that's as good as they're going to get. Yeah. So I'll live the rest of my life with, you know, arms that aren't quite straight, but yeah. Which is but still annoying. quite functional yeah, though, really. Yeah, yeah. So, Better than being stuck up here. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. yeah, and I, you know, that that was annoying for those couple of years that it was like yeah. that. But when you when you're in the Burns community and you meet some of the people and what they've gone through, you kind mm. of go, hmm, I can't really complain. You yeah, know, I did okay out of it. Really, I kept all my fingers and I've got my sight. And you yeah. know, that there's things that you see when you meet other burn survivors that you go, wow, geez, it could have been heaps worse than that. Mm. Um, so how do you, like, because I know, like, when you get burnt, um, like, when you sweat, how does your body keep cool, like, for yourself? Is it yeah. is it your body at the bottom that is yeah, keeping cool? Like- I, I think so. I mean, I, I struggle with running in the heat. Yeah. Um, but I tend to just slow myself down a little bit. Okay. You know, I just did a, the half marathon in Malulaba couple of months ago mm-hmm. and I was fine for at 6 a.m. for the first you know hour or so and then yeah. as it starts to warm up I start to struggle and I slow myself down and I kind of I can I can mm. judge it and yeah. go oh yeah no better better cruise it off a little bit yeah um 
but yeah, I've never, I don't, I mean, I don't struggle in a hot kitchen. That doesn't bother me at all. Mm. Um, but I, um, you know, there's, there's bits like that bit there that mm-hmm. didn't get burnt. <laughs> I sweat out of there a lot. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting, actually. One one funny story is that scar there yeah. was uh, one of the last operations I had was under my, my eyelids here. Yeah. I had to replace that skin. Yeah. And they took, so they they took a, a chunk because they needed not just skin, they needed muscle as well. So they took a chunk out of my bicep and then... They put it under here. Muscle to go here? Yeah, there's something oh, about wow. what they, whatever it was that they needed from here. They had to, you know, yeah, they, okay. they put it there. And then a few months later, I started growing armpit hairs out of my eyelid. Oh. I started to pluck. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. And you know, a lot of birds, like, you know, people that had to tap theirs, now, now it's there sort yeah. of thing. So... <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of that, but that's a that's a funny story, you know. Yeah. That's a, you 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 know you learn You'd to, have laugh to laugh about it. Yeah. yeah. So I know that you um, decided that um, once you once you come out of the coma, and it was a couple of weeks after, if I'm correct, you decided that you were going to run five k, even though everyone told you no. What was the drive to do that? I don't know. There, I think there was probably just lots of things at that point that I wasn't able to control, but I was able to do that. You know, it was yeah. kind of, and it still is to this day. We were talking about it before. My, my the way my brain works is I have to set goals for myself and tell everybody about them so that I make sure that I do them. So, yeah. and that was the first one. It was kind of like, you know. I came out. I was in I was staying with my dad in, in Karoi and going to rehab every day for you know physio and OT and ex fizz and doing that every day. And I said mm. to the ex fizz, oh, I want to do you know a, a, there's this five k run at the end of June and I want to do it. And they're like, no, you're not doing that. It's ridiculous. You know, I'd go out the back and run up the road a little bit and mm. my heart, bit, heart rate would get to 240 beats a minute. And they'd be like, stop, you're going to die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd be like, no, it's okay. And I'd tell Did just, you feel like it was like? Nah, not at all. Ah, okay. So, but, you know, they do, there's stories of that, of, of people going home from hospital with burn, burns and then overdoing it in their hearts because it is, really puts a lot of pressure on your heart. Yeah. But I just built up to it slowly and, you know, I did it in the end. I did the 5K and then a month later I did 10K and then, you know, so I kept on setting got big goals for myself. Yeah. A month after that, I did two 10Ks in, in a in a weekend or did one at Wynnum and then I drove to Casino and did the one down there. <laughs> <laughs> but meanwhile, you know, people like my dad are going, oh, you idiot. Yeah. Um, but it was really important to me to have that, you know, it was something that I could do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it, and it also, you know, anyone who runs knows how, how – good it makes you feel it brings on all those happy endorphins yeah and it's like a high it, it feels is, incredible totally, yeah and do you think that's your like your co- um, coping mechanism of what you had been through is that why you believe that you felt it was important for you to set those challenges oh definitely yeah yeah, yeah. and i and i still do it you know what i because i can and now i'm very i'm really busy with work and running around all over the place doing all these different things but so it's easy to get distracted from that and Mm -hmm. I tend to get a little bit antsy if I don't you know have a regular routine of some sort of exercise so I'll Mm. just do random stuff like decide that I'm going to climb the mountain at you know Pomona every every day for a month or something um yeah get this guys Matt was just telling me that is it 31 days that you're gonna yeah every day of October just just came to me as like an epiphany on the 30th of September (laughs) I was like because I've been really slack and I've been drinking too much and all that sort of stuff you get into these bad habits and and eating too much brie and stuff yeah. like that, you know? <laughs> and so I was like, I really need something. What can it be? And because, you know, I know that I'm going to be away for three days, you know, four days on Great Keppel next week, and then I'm going to be back, and then I'm going to Bill a Wheeler, and so, and then I'm going to be at the Good Food and Wine Show. But it's like, what's something that I can do that I can do every single day, mm. and I know that I can do it because it's not going to take too much time, and I don't need any equipment to do it. Yeah. So five kilometers a day, running five k's a day, wherever I happen to be, whether it's running up and down the beach on Great Keppel Island, or yeah. you know, around the city when I'm down here for good food and wine show, or whatever, mm. it's something that I can do and stick to. Mm. And when you do that sort of thing as well, it makes you 
want to drink less makes you want to eat healthier Mm. you know there's so many more other effects other than just getting the exercise of running 5k yeah and also it's yeah it's those happy drugs you get every day and it actually makes you feel more energized than Mm, absolutely and i think like the discipline of doing it then because you've got discipline in that area it applies to all areas of your life yep definitely so what's your um what's your new um, career path like? Where are you deciding that you're going to go with your career? Or you just have no idea. I don't even know. I keep on thinking about all the different things that I could possibly do. I'm kind of you know it's funny because I didn't really choose this path. You know the peppers thing I said yes to because it was good because it means I can still do all these things like go to right off to Emerald or Winton or whatever and do these have these fun experiences and meet crazy you know crazy country people which is something that it's like a hobby of mine yeah um it's it's awesome it's really I've got friends and family all over the countryside yeah um and that all just happened by chance that you know I get asked to go to Roma and do a big dinner out there and then someone from Chinchilla happens to know the person from Roma (laughs) and then they end up (laughs) in Chinchilla or St George or whatever and I go to these towns and I, I immerse myself in the community and I like being part of, you know, I'll do park run if I'm there or I'll do whatever, mm. you know, be, become, enjoy being part of that community for a few days. And so I tend to end up getting asked back. Mm. So a lot of the places I'm going back to year and year again, and that's been the last sort of five or so years. Mm. Um, and now it feels like kind of like that is my life for a while, you know, yeah. like, It'd be really, it's really hard for me to say no to anything. Like I usually just say yes to everything everyone asks me to do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, might as well. But, it, you know, it's once you've been to a te- uh, one of those towns, you're kind of like, oh, it'd be sad if I didn't go. You're like, so you end up going back again. And But it, it's, you know, they'll reach a point, I suppose, where I, where I think I'll probably kind of go, oh, okay, it's probably enough of that now. I should settle down. Mm. I've got, you know, a two-year-old daughter and I've got, Hopefully another one on the way soon. Oh, congratulations. Um, there's no guarantees of anything yet, but that's our plan. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I probably do need to, you know, become a grown-up at some point. <laughs> and then, <laughs> You're just living life how it yeah, comes to you at the moment. Yeah, and that's been really good, and I do enjoy that. But, it, you know, I probably – it actually it, it takes a toll um, – you know, physically and mentally, when you go to something, you go, you're doing work like that, and you go there, and you end up doing three 15-hour days or whatever, and it's a day to get there and a day to get back, and then you work mm-hmm. and work and work, and you don't eat properly, and you, you know, you inevitably you do end up drinking too much and all that sort of stuff, and so you come home kind of, you know, <laughs> you need a little lie down. Yeah. Um. So you know, that's not a really sustainable lifestyle for forever. Mm. Um. As much as I do enjoy it, and I get satisfaction from it. Mm. and because you're traveling a lot like what you're just saying about drinking and eating do you go for like are you conscious of what you're eating or you just very much so yeah okay. I am but sometimes it's really hard you know if you're in an airport try and find try finding something healthy or <laughs> you know yeah um and there is actually to their credit there is some places now I found a healthy place the other day um at Brisbane airport which was really you know quite made me ha- really happy but I do t- I do tend to like I got to, to Winton and knew that the only thing I was going to get was probably like steak, chips and salad at the pub. Mm. And so I went, just went to the fruit shop and just bought, you know, feta and tomatoes and olives and bread, mm. you know, took them all back to my room. And that's, I had that food there. I knew I was going to be able to, you know, eat well when I needed to. Mm. Um, Cause there's nothing worse than eating. Like what you said, like going to the, air, the um, airport and then eating the shitty food and then you feel tired already. And then yeah. you've ate shit and then you may have not exercised. So it's just like a, a spiral down. It is. So Absolutely. Yeah. So it's yeah, good to I've have... started to try and get, a little, try to get a little bit more sensible with that stuff now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a bit, think ahead a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think planning is a great um, thing when, especially when you're traveling or working a lot. Yeah. So tell me, Matt, about um, – I'd love to learn more about the discipline in your mind. Like when you've set, you've set all these challenges, what do you actually think about when you go to accomplish something? Like what is it – have you have, – do you plan things as in I'll just do this and get to this point and then I'll try a little bit harder next time? Or like how do you push yourself? Yeah, I, like I think I've never been competitive at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I'll do – you know, going to a running 
thing or whatever and a, the, the last thing on my mind is winning I, I wanted if I go into a half marathon obviously I want to do a better time than the last time I did mm-hmm. um and you know that that sort of thing so mm. and that's just for me personally to go hey yeah I beat myself you know yeah and that's that's nice um but yeah I think for me like things are running's my thing you know and that's mm-hmm. something that I've done for a long time I enjoy it I like the fact that my phone doesn't ring and there's no emails and you yeah. know, all those things that come yeah. with running. Like you're just alone. Yeah. I don't even like running with other people. I hate it. Yeah. So it's like, no, don't, please don't talk to me. Yeah. I'm yeah. In my own head. And normally I'm thinking about food. You know? <laughs> I'm thinking about today I was on the treadmill and I was going, okay, so I could put the burrata with the, um, with the beetroot and then the <laughs> data check chips on that. And that's what I'm, that's what's going on in my head the whole time. Yeah. But at least I'm not being bothered. I'm just, mm. you know. It's like some get, time out for it you. It totally is, yeah. Um, but, you know, making a challenge like, oh, you know, I'm going to run five kilometres a day for a month was just, it is, it's a way of me um, proving to myself that I have got the discipline still to do that mm. um, and that, you know, it keeps me honest, I suppose. That's yeah. That's the thing, you know, I just... I want to go. Okay, yeah, I know it'll be, it'll do me good. Won't mm. do me any harm. Mm. It's only five k's. It's not like it's, you know, mm. I'm doing 168 marathons, yeah. 168 <laughs> countries. Oh, that's insane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. you know, that sort of stuff. Just, oh, I can't even imagine that. Do you have any days where you're just like, oh, nah, I don't want to do it today? Yeah, and that's the thing I think about, like me committing to something like that. Like, if every time if I'm going to do, if I decide I'm going to do a half marathon. I instantly go on and book my ticket for it and then I tell everybody I know <laughs> that way I have to do it you know I yeah. can't fail and it's um, good because then they're going to ask you about they, it you know, and then you're like oh god I've got to have, have done it and that's yeah. the thing like you know if I just went oh yeah I might run 5k's every now and then yeah then sometimes I will sometimes I won't but mm. it, you know I know that now I've decided that that's what's going to be my goal for this month mm. I'll do it even if I have to do it at 3 a.m yeah and, you know I'll, I'll get that I'll get it done every day yeah um because that's that's how my brain works it'll be mm. like yep yeah, no I, I don't care you know how tired I am or whether I don't feel like it mm. I said I'm doing it so I'm doing it mm. and do you feel like that um that's some something that you would pass on to other people saying like if you want to live a healthy lifestyle um do something like that like tell everybody like to help you keep accountable what would your advice be yeah, i guess for me it works i don't know everyone's different when it yeah. comes to that sort of thing and i often say to people yeah i do this and they go oh i'm not a runner it's like well find something you do you can do you do like if you're mm. a swimmer do you just can you walk mm. you know whatever mm. um but, but I think, apply that principle like, yeah that's right yeah, yeah. apply that in any way you can like yeah find something that you do enjoy doing though there's no point in like trying to run every day yeah. for a month and <laughs> hating it every second of yeah it. you know I, I don't i don't see it as a burden i actually look forward mm. to it so, but i think too as well you're not going out there to smash yourself no like you're doing it at like what you said you you it's a, like a clarity of the mind yep. it's time for you to think and yeah you're just cruising along until you get it done yep. by the sounds of it so i think that's a good thing because i think if you were smashing yourself then yeah, it doesn't, it's not enjoyable. Yeah. No matter what it is. Yeah. And you've got to take, I think that's the, that's an important part of it as well is that you've got to take the time to appreciate your surroundings. Like I'll do that 5Ks in all different places. Like yesterday it was down the Noosa River and the day before that was in the park in Pomona. And so you're seeing all diff, if you, if you let yourself be a little bit mindful of your surroundings, you'll see so much cool stuff Mm. at the same time. And You'll be, you know, to me, it's, you know, I love, the thing, reason I love climbing my mountain, I call it my mountain at Pomona, yeah. you know, it, you know, I feel like I know every single rock on that hill, you know, I, yeah. I love it. Um, but you notice it change all through the year. You know, when I'm home, I'll do it three times a week if I can, mm. just because I love, it's got a special energy, that rock, you know, it's, mm. it's a special mountain. Um, but you see it change through the seasons, you know, you'll go up one day and it'll be, you know, it'll be dry and then all of a sudden it'll rain and then everything will just spring to life or, you know, spring mm. will hit and then there'll be just wildflowers everywhere and you've got to take time to actually notice it, yeah. you know, mm. they're surrounded by it. So to me that's really important as well. We notice the smells and the sounds and the, you know, 
what's happening with the vegetation and all that sort of stuff. Well, to mm. me, that's that's a um, really good value. Yeah, because that's life. That's that's what's around us. Yeah. So tell me, Matt, what do you want to be known for? Oh, gee, something I've been um, dwelling on actually lately. I don't know. I I think. I mean, you um, <laughs> earlier you you uh, introduced me as a celebrity chef, and I said, please don't call me that. <laughs> and there, and I, this is an anecdote I always use it, and it's um, uh, Anthony Bourdain, who's a was a chef, a very well known celebrity chef from New York once said that he'd rather be called a referred to as a habitual masturbator than a celebrity <laughs> chef and that's exactly how I feel every time some can you just call me a habitual masturbator Matkalinsky <laughs> instead of that because it just to me it's just like ugh, like I've worked my entire life as a chef and I love my profession and I love doing what I do and the fact that I was on telly for a you know eight or nine years mm. on a you know a funny cooking show mm. now i'm a celebrity chef you know but that's not what i who i am yeah i wasn't even very good at it being a celebrity <laughs> chef you know like now I've, I've you know we all of us guys who were on that show and went on to do other stuff uh, you know we've actually all become reasonably good presenters now because we were thrown into a position a situation of having to talk to camera and do you know feel comfortable with it so mm. we're actually all most you know most of the guys i know are still in touch with all those guys from ready steady cook and we've all gone on to do to be actually quite good presenters we do a cooking demonstration we're good at it you know yeah um and that's just by chance that we, we were on that happened to be on that show but mostly you know i want to i guess i want to be known for you know i'm not for being the best chef in the world or anything like that just mm. maybe you know inspiring people to to enjoy cooking mm. you know that's what it should be mm. like i was saying it you know to me running's not um a, you know i don't feel or exercising to me isn't a burden it's like a pleasure mm. it's a joy that i look forward to mm. and it's the same thing with cooking like i'll cook all day in the kitchen at work come home look forward to making dinner yeah i don't come home and go oh now i've got to make dinner i'm like yeah, yeah i get to make dinner <laughs> you know so it's and I try to instill that especially into kids that I work with. All these towns mm. I go to, it's usually like hospitality students that mm. that come and help me. Yeah. Um. You know, and usually I want to just strangle them most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, that's the thing I say to them. You know, it's like guys, you know, this the this is, you know, when we're going to service and we're just about to try and serve three hundred people, or whatever. It's like now remember this is like the hospitality industry. Smile. Like, yeah have fun you know we need to get the job done but also enjoy yourselves like yeah. this is a, a joyous thing where it's a fun thing we're making people happy let's just enjoy what we're doing together mm. um and so and that's how people should feel you know i think people are just afraid when it comes to f- cooking and food mm. you can and maybe that maybe it's tv shows being a little bit too complicated that's done that to people <laughs> they think it's hard but it's actually not you know mm. it's so what's your advice for people out there they're wanting to get healthy now and they want to cook at home? What would you say would be some good tips for people? Um, a few things I'd say would be don't overcomplicate things, you know. Don't mm. try and make the 17-layer chocolate cake. Just <laughs> make a really nice pasta dish or, yeah. you know, buy, buy the best possible ingredients you can with the budget that you've got mm. because then you have to do less with them. Mm-hmm. Um and would you don't, recommend organic or you don't recommend? Oh, yeah. I mean, organic bet is great. It's mm. it's fantastic. You know, it's you know it's it's going to be probably much more de- nutrient-dense than, you know, a carrot that's grown organically is going to be much more nutrient-dense than a carrot that's been grown on a million-acre carrot mm. farm and pumped with heaps of water and, you know, there's the perfect-looking carrot. Mm. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, if you want, you know, to get the, the best nutrition out of what you're eating, by all means, organic is fantastic. Mm. Um, but also shop by the seasons. And the way to do that is to, you know, visit your farmer's market or whatever and see what's there and, and get to know the farmers that are there and mm. understand what is in season, when it's in season. When, you know, citrus is a winter fruit and that's what we need in winter for our colds and stuff like that. There's a reason yeah. for that stuff's around when it's around. Yeah. And if you eat like that, then that's good. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, you know, in the same vein, don't, 
you know, get out your glossy recipe books and go, oh, I'm going to cook that and go and go out and shop for it. Mm. Go to the shops and see what looks good, whether it's the supermarket or the farmer's mm. market or the local fruit shop, or whatever. Go and walk around and go, oh, gee, the broccoli looks good at the moment. I'll have some of that, mm. you know, and cook like that rather than, you know. Mm. And you, create a dish from what is available. What is actually looks good, you mm. know, so... How can you tell what looks good when you go into a supermarket? Is it like, you know, like I know I go to the farmer's market, like the organic one. And when I go, I've been taught that the sort of the odd looking fruit and veg is Mm. mostly the best because it hasn't been made perfect. Yeah. Would you say that? Yeah. Um, And yeah, people need to get used to that idea that, you know, stuff doesn't have to look perfect Mm. um, to be the best. Um, yeah, there's certainly that element to it. Um, but, yeah, I think it's about experience and, and putting you, throwing yourself into, you know, learning that stuff, you know, getting getting used to shopping like that. And mm. you'll soon work out that, oh, you know, you might make mistakes. Oh, you know, that wasn't really very good, <laughs> you know, beetroot or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You'll know from that. But yeah. you, the only way to do it, the only way to learn is, to, is through experience, really. Mm. And do you think like, because you know when people get into a fitness trend and they're like, oh, I've got to I've got to make my meals for the, the whole week. Do you recommend that? Or do you feel like, because look, I've done it many times and then it sits in the fridge because I'm like, after the yeah. second date, it like loses the taste or something. I don't know what it is and it's yeah. disgusting. What do you... Oh, it's tough. You know, I'm lucky that I, I live in a little country town. We've got a great little fruit shop that's, you know, it's, it's full of all stuff from local producers and that's how I shop. I'll go down, I'd rather go down there every day and go, oh, I need two zucchinis and I need mm. some pumpkin and I need whatever and I walk next door to the butchers and I'll get what I need from there or whatever it is mm. um, because then you know that every day it's fresh. Fresh. You know, not everyone's got time for shopping like that mm. you know, and, and I don't. I don't do it every day but that's how I like to do it. I don't like to just stock the whole fridge full of stuff and mm. then throw half of it out two weeks later. Mm. I'd rather just buy a little bit as I need it, super fresh and and make sure I use it up. Mm. I mean, that's another thing that we just suffer from in this country is just chronic food wastage yeah it's huge and you just go oh, everyone just buys it because we're just too much. so available to us isn't it mm. we have whatever we want yeah lots of it <laughs> and we just waste so much of it so yeah buy small amounts of stuff and use it up mm. um, so wh- i'd love to know your opinion on because this is a massive thing at the moment is pre-made meals getting delivered <laughs> what's your thoughts because Honestly, like I've, I've tasted, um, oh, I can't remember the brands, but I've tasted ones and I've looked at the back and I'm like, oh, no wonder why that was shit. Like there's so many like numbers, I have no idea. Yep. But then I've tried like organic ones and I'm like, well, they're not actually too bad. Yep. But what's your thoughts? Oh, look, I mean, if it's, uh, you need convenience sometimes and there's nothing mm. wrong with that sort of thing, I suppose. You know, mm. it's, I don't know, it's not something that I would buy. Yeah, I had a bit, I had a catering business in Noosa where that's what we actually did was every two weeks we'd send out an, a, a mailing list to all the local people around Noosa and a new menu of six main courses for two people and we but we'd make it with real ingredients. There was nothing artificial about any of yeah. it. Yeah, and the, and it became this cult following thing that you know that we go, go to the, you know ladies of Noosa's house and open the freezer <laughs> and it was just all our stuff there was nothing else in it and they, they open the fridge and there's nothing in it apart from the dish that they're defrosting for the yeah. day sort of thing and they, yeah a lot of them would have starved to death if we hadn't been there but um yeah so you know they, I'm sure there's there's more and more of that on the market now of actual really good quality versions of that mm. you know there's um there's the, the dodgy, frozen, you know, diety sort of stuff that's, you know, to me it's just like, oh, it's just so far removed from actual real food. And it's mm. just, there's so much, so much plastic involved and, you know, it's just yeah. kind of like, oh, so much packaging. Um, you know, I, I went to grab carrots the other day and I grabbed a plastic packet on them and I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Just yeah. get four carrots from the carrot section and put them in the trolley, like mm. take, wash them when you get home, whatever. But, you know, it's just like there's so much of that's, that in the food industry. It's just rife, just wastage and packaging and 
I just yeah, it's got something's got to give with that. It's mm. Really, just every day I, I must be getting old because I'm really I'm really grumpy <laughs> about it now. Like but I think, man, like, but we've become a, a consume um, society. So when yeah. we see oh two dollars and I get this much, we're yeah. like bargain. I'm gonna have that. So that's the way we're being programmed. Really, is to buy yeah. more, 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 more. Yeah. So no wonder why we have a leftover of heaps of fruit and veg. Yeah. It is um, about retraining ourselves, I think, a little bit. And it, like a great example of how people have become, you know, we're getting there. No, no, it's by no means a perfect situation, but taking your bags shopping with you when you go oh, now. Yeah. You know, imagine, what, 20 years ago, I'd be like, what are you doing taking shopping bags with you? Like, got mm. them there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. You come home with 28 plastic bags <laughs> and then throw them all in the bin. Exactly. Um, so now people are actually remembering they've got, oh, you know, I, I wouldn't go to the shops if I didn't have my, my bags, you know, or I'd mm. go and get a box or something like that. But mm. So maybe we're getting better at that sort of thing. Mm. So tell me, when it comes to weight loss, because you know a lot about food, what would you recommend for people? Because I know a lot of people that just go broccoli, meat, rice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I'm probably no expert on nutrition. But you know a lot about food, right? So yeah, tell us what you would recommend for someone who they're maybe they don't want to follow a diet and they just want to create some healthy habits around the kitchen. Yeah, well, I think I mean, there's there's the obvious things really, like don't have so many carbs. You know, mm-hmm. don't have so much fat. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's obvious when you look at it. Like yeah, that. yeah. Like, but and how to do that? You know, I mean. When I'm on a bit of a kick and, you know, which, and I eat pretty healthy most of the time anyway, but, mm. um, you know, it's a lot of sweet potato instead of potato. It's, mm. um, you know, lots of green vegetables, making a meal about the vegetables, like I was saying before, rather mm. than about the meat, make mm. the vegetables the star. Yeah. Now, one of my favorite dinners at the moment is just getting a whole lot of like pumpkin, um, eggplants, fennel whatever chopping it all up you know and it can be carrots it can be zucchinis whatever Mm. toss it all in a bit of oil salt and pepper put it in a tray line with some bacon paper and just throw it in the oven Mm. and just let it all caramelize rip it out dollop heaps of natural yogurt all over it and Mm. heaps of dukkah yeah (laughs) just get a jar of dukkah from the shop and just like sprinkle that and that's like your flavoring on top and the crunchy part mm. um so you've got something creamy you've got something crunchy and you've got all these beautiful vegetables of all different textures mm. and it's a, you know and if you want to add protein to it add throw some a tin of chickpeas in at the last minute in with the veggies and then you've got protein yeah you know and that's a, a dish that's Simple. healthy and so tasty and you sit and you can like go like that you can have a massive pile of it yeah. and you can eat yourself <laughs> stupid yeah. knowing that you're not going to get fat from it because it's you know, it's all just healthy vegetables you know? mm. um but you know yeah I, I at home i pretty much avoid potatoes i'm, I'm certainly no um do you recommend lots of spices in that to create like tasty meals yeah, or having lots of cool lots of good flavorings in general in the cupboard is mm. the way to give yourself a chance at having like lots of different mm. options to go what's your for. top five Oh, a good vinegar. Yeah. So you need to get yourself a good red wine vinegar or white wine vinegar or sherry vinegar or apple cider vinegar that you use as a dressing for, you know, so get a good bottle of olive oil. Yeah. Get a good bottle of vinegar. Yeah. Get a good bottle of soy sauce, not yeah. like dodgy, you know, <laughs> dollar a bottle stuff. Get yeah. like, get, go for the best. Once again, buy the best that you can afford for your yeah. budget, but get a good quality. There's a massive difference between really bad soy sauce and really mm. good soy sauce same with fish sauce there's cheap fish sauce there's good fish sauce mm. um you know all those sorts of things so yeah I, I would say you know the top top things vinegar olive oil mustard is a really good one yeah and a jar, good jar of dijon mustard or something oh yeah because that's if you've got those three things olive, good olive oil good vinegar it's good dijon mustard whisk them all together you can make any salad just go go from here to here yeah you know so that's that's something that I always make sure I have. And then there's, yeah, the things like your soy sauce that's good quality, fish sauce that's good quality, mm. those sorts of things. Um, you know, and then you've got, you know, 
good anything you can any different combo you can make you can do thai you can do chinese you can do you know mediterranean yeah <laughs> so yeah. what's your favorite i love mexican oh really yeah mexican's yeah. pretty good i probably go for more uh gen as a general rule at home i go for like more mediterranean sort of style yeah. stuff like french italian greek middle eastern is a big one for me i love mm. like arabic flavors and and that style oh really it's very much a like a produce driven cuisine it's all mm. it's mostly about the vegetables it's about mm. the eggplants and the tomatoes and the capsicums and the mm. zucchinis and all that sort of stuff so and i love that sort of thing so mm. and nothing goes past a cooked eggplant oh my god oh yeah it's i one just of my very love favorites. it yep oh we can be friends now yeah okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming on the show, Matt, it's and sharing your knowledge about being a chef and telling the guys about your experience um, going through and how you've had your skin replaced and now living life to the full, um, meeting all the incredible people around the world. Mm. So thank you thank for you. coming on board. Thanks for having me. It's been, been really good. Thanks so much for your support, guys. If you're listening to the podcast, please leave me a five-star written review. If you're on YouTube, like and subscribe so you can keep up to date with these incredible stories.